um, ask uh, the questions you you want uh, on a principled um, in a principled manner. Um, we are recording the session, and uh, if the quality is okay, we will be very happy to share it if the content is interesting. But again, um, I think it's one of the of several sessions we would like to put out. And if things go well today, um, then we will do more sessions of that same kind or on a specific topic so that we have a lively discussion together around um, not only the tool, but the kind of research you want to do with it. So again, if you want to ask a question, the best way is to type it in in the chat box. This will be also logged and saved in, uh, in, uh, with the Zoom session that we can share later. And then we can unmute you um, if you want to ask uh, anything specific that could benefit the rest of the group. There is also the possibility that you can share your screen if you have a brainstorm uh, session running on your computer. And if you want to show live to everyone um, something that will illustrate your question better or your request, we take requests for new features, etc. cetera. Um, so um, let's see what happens. But uh, to, to get started, I would like to share my screen a little bit. Uh, to basically show you uh, the environment of Brainstorm and a few key aspects that some of you may not know or may have missed. And then I will hand the microphone to Martin uh, Cousino, who's uh, one of our uh, key developers on the project, working here also in Montreal, so that he can give you a very brief tour of the environment and more importantly of the new features, some of the new features we've been adding uh, over the past uh, months. And then we'll take it from there. Okay, so it should, shouldn't be too long, this introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen here. It's just basically my web uh, browser. Uh, I hope everybody can see. So first of all, um, it's a uh, you know, collective effort, this brainstorm project. Uh, it started at USC, I'm afraid to say two decades ago. And it's still based at USC, but also at other institutions. So McGill, Neuro is the MNI. UT Health with John Mosier. We have friends and colleagues at MIT. It's been supported by several uh, cycles of uh, NIH grants, and we are very grateful for that support. Um, so the website, basically, you don't need to remember it. You probably all know it. You just Google brainstorm EEG or MEG, and it will take you to that page. And first of all, for those of you who are very newcomers to the, um, to the tool, we do have uh, a video here that you can see. It's also available on YouTube. And it's a video that basically takes you through all the, the basic steps of Brainstorm from importing your data in the database to reviewing it. Visualization is really key and interaction is really key with the, the graphical user interface. I think it's, it's one of the very strong and unique points of Brainstorm so that you don't need necessarily to know how to code to make it um, happen for you. So from there to uh, source mapping and, and imaging, of course, which is another uh, great strength and registration with uh, individual or template MRIs. So um, we, if you go to that page, we have a reference page that shows you basically key articles here that are open access and that basically tell you the story of Brainstorm and that please, we would appreciate if you could cite them whenever you publish uh, with Brainstorm. Um, so there is the seminal paper uh, written by Francois Tadel from 2011, which is an overview of the software from, at that time. And um, it covers a lot of grounds. And more recently, we published in Frontiers uh, two papers Here they are, two papers, one specifically dedicated for MEG or EEG group analysis. And it's not necessarily like a scientific paper per se, uh, in the sense that these are not new data or new results. It's actually data from a repository uh, at Cambridge. And you see that it reads and looks like uh, basically a tutorial with single subject analysis, inclusion of structural MRI, uh, and importantly, you know, reviewing raw files, um, 
uh, detection of events, maybe I'm going a bit too fast here, but et cetera, et cetera. And very importantly, uh, all the, uh, basically, the, the, it's, it's one of the strengths of uh, basically brainstorm. You can actually do your single subject or group analysis using the graphical user interface, but there is also the ability to automate uh, basically these uh, features and write scripts either uh, by yourself, of course, by calling brainstorm functions as a library, but also use the scripting tool in brainstorm to basically um, generate a MATLAB file that can be executed on your uh, local computer on a or high performance computing server. And all the scripts basically uh, used for this uh, paper are available uh, for download in, uh, in, uh, from, that, from that paper. Then we have a second paper that was published about a year ago, which is for the analysis of resting state uh, data. The first author is uh, Guillaume Nizot, who was with us uh, here in Montreal as well for uh, quite a while. And same story, we use uh, data available from a repository, Omega, and all the scripts are, uh, basically all the steps are defined and itemized uh, so that you can reproduce it at home. And finally, the last paper from the Brainstorm family was published by Konstantinos Maziotis, who's a, a graduate also from the MNI here, and I think Konstantinos is with us uh, today. And uh, what he contributed is basically uh, an extension of brainstorm to multi-scale electrophysiology. For those of you who work essentially in animal models with multi-unit recordings, or uh, who actually work in patients um, with uh, also uh, you know, multi-unit single cell recordings, there's uh, more and more of this happening today in research. And all these papers are open access. And if you have questions regarding multi-unit and electrophysiology and recordings, um, we are happy to take questions uh, today, of course, about this. Okay, if I go back to uh, the website, um, you may know already that the best way to learn Brainstorm is actually to look into the tutorials right there. And so it's a very extensive uh, set of, um, you know, step-by-step -step procedures that will really help you uh, be productive with the software from basically importing your data. And when I say import, if you go back to the first page, you will see a long list of uh, possible data formats that are supported by uh, the software. So a lot of EG, I think all the possible MEG uh, systems are supported today in Brainstorm and many other uh, kinds of uh, recordings, including NIRS, which is also a relatively recent addition to um, the software, and also sensor locations, MRI volumes, uh, surface meshes, etc. cetera. Um, so from there to uh, basically, some very, very specialized uh, analysis scenarios. So some very specific to EEG and epilepsy, for instance. Even some NIRS data is available, thanks to Christophe Grovar's uh, group um, and their contribution. And you see, we have a long list of advanced tutorials, depending on what you want to do and uh, how you want to um, uh, proceed with your own data. So machine learning decoding is available uh, thanks to contributions from uh, Dimitrios Pantasis group at MIT. And um, it's a kind of a breaking news that very soon we will have, and it's already in there as a, as a you know, alpha testing uh, feature, we will have a finite element modeling uh, in collaboration with Carsten Volter's uh, tools in Germany, Duneuro, so that we can really reach uh, you know, a maximum um, precision and detail in terms of the shape and conductivity modeling uh, for MEG and EEG. So we may put up basically uh, a session uh, specifically on that, and that's a major contribution from uh, Takfarinas Mediani and Juan in, uh, um, in uh, John Mosher's group, and uh, also in Richard Leahy's group, of course, at USC. And the very good news is that, uh, you know, one of the limiting steps uh, for FEM, finite element modeling, 
was uh, mesh generation, which are volumic meshes. And again, uh, Richard and John's group has, have worked really uh, beautifully to have a mesh generation a procedure directly into Rainstorm. So that's really a, a major step forward. So more on that maybe later, Pro probably not today, but when it's fully released. Um, I don't want to take more time. I will uh, give the microphone to, to um, Martin shortly. But I want to point out that you're not in there by yourself, all alone. We do have a very active user forum. Uh, whenever you register to the forum, it's going to give you also access to the download pages of uh, Brainstorm. So Brainstorm is free. Um, we realize that not all of you have access to a MATLAB license, and it's really a concern to us. And it's an ongoing discussion we have with MathWorks, especially with, you know, um, increasing and in, uh, interest in using Python. For now, we are staying with MATLAB. Um, but if you don't have access to a MATLAB license, we provide uh, the ability for you to download an executable version of Brainstorm so that you can at least run the software uh, on pretty much any operating system. Um, so uh, the user form is very active. Uh, this is where you need to post your questions. And Francois Tadel, who's uh, the uh, senior uh, developer on the project, is back in France now, but still very, very active on the project, is really you know, helping and Martin and pretty much all of us whenever we find the time to help. Um, I think this is a great tool so that you don't feel uh, all alone. This is the Brainstorm download page, and you see you, we have gigabytes of data that is available for you to basically um, run the tutorials. So even if you don't have data yourself, or if you do EEG and you don't have access to MEG and you're curious about how MEG looks like, you can have access to this data freely. And um, from single subjects uh, to group um, analysis to reproduce the, uh, the paper I was talking about earlier. Um, we provide, we also are very, you know, uh, concerned by the fact that not all of you have access to individual MRIs for your subject, and therefore we provide you with the uh, possibility to download anatomy templates, which are T1 weighted MRIs and surfaces, so that you can at least, you know, use um, a, a, a template MRI that that is of similar age and size of your subject. There are some warping procedures in Brainstorm where you can start from a, a template and basically adjust the size of the template to the shape and size of, the, of your subjects if you do have electrode locations or um, digitized points on the scalp. There are also, you know, for those of you working in pediatrics and uh, with children, we provide MRI templates for uh, even infants. And, um, from seven weeks to one year old and a bit later as well. So for those of you who want to follow us more casually, we do have a Facebook page and it's a great way to keep track of, you know, announcements for workshops and um, major features being added to the software. So please follow us. We also have, a, and that's more recent, a Twitter account. It's called Brainstorm Today. That's the Twitter, Twitter handle. Um, so please follow us there. And I think I'm done with my, uh, you know, basic, basic presentation. Um, before we move on, I would like to see with the... Um, yeah, I would like to see with uh, Mark if there are any questions uh, in the chat box. That we uh, that we could take. So I'm going to unmute you, unmute you, uh, Mark, so that you can ask a, a question that came out. Yes, thank you. So I think at this point there's one relevant question. Uh, I think most of them are very specific for, uh, to the software, so we can wait a, a little bit for later. But uh, one was about if uh, Brainstorm has been approved for clinical use. So yeah, that's a great question. We haven't. Uh, so basically uh, FDA or Health Canada or uh, CE approval in Europe or the equivalent in your country, um, Brainstorm is really considered as a research tool. Uh, 
However, we do have many clinicians using it for in complement to basically the uh, clinically approved uh, tools uh, that they have and that they use for EEG and MEG, electrophysiology, et cetera, to generate the clinical report. And some of them actually attach to the clinical report a research um, report, whatever they call it, which feature brainstorm results with a disclaimer at the top that says that these results were produced with a, an investigational tool and a research only uh, product, if you will, and they are given for information, for additional information. So it's possible to use it in uh, what I'm describing is one possible scenario how to use it and we, for clinical purposes, uh, but it's important to use this kind of disclaimer. Um, any other questions, Mark? Yes, sorry. Um, I think one that just came up was relevant. Let me just, uh, yes, uh, pretty general question. So uh, any plans for, uh, in, uh, for adding functionality for uh, non-human primates or I guess more generally animals in, in general? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have that already. Uh, and I would like to refer that that uh, that person to this paper and maybe i can uh, copy the link in the chat box and again it's um, it's multi-scale electrophysiology for essentially animal models right so we are talking about a single electrodes arrays of electrodes stacks of electrodes that are used to measure single cells or multiple units and also lfps and um, Maybe I can only I can show you a quick um, you know disc description of what it does, but basically it's brainstorm and on top of brainstorm or within brainstorm, Constantinos has added the ability to do spike sorting in a supervised or unsupervised way, and for that we uh, call from brainstorms uh, three or four different possibly you know. Um, mm three or four different tools that already do this kind of spike sorting really well. So uh, ultra mega sorter, uh, kilo sort, and uh, wave cluster, for instance. And um, once um, the, uh, the spike sorting is done, the events are registered in brainstorm and you can extract LFPs with respect to the spikes or external events. You could look at spiking events and derive uh, spike field coherence, uh, spike rates, raster plots, etc., and visualization. Um, I can maybe show you just one quick um, figure that I think is a, is a nice illustration of uh, what I'm talking about. You see here, for instance, it's a representation of an MRI. I think it's coming up now, yes. It's an MRI from a non-human primate, and there are a couple of Utah arrays that are positioned here over the, the frontal uh, lobe and here over the temporal lobe. And if you zoom in, you see the data, and these are the potentials or spike rates encoding the, in color. So the short answer is yes, um, we can use, and uh, uh, you can use Brainstorm for um, animal electrophysiology. Here, this is an example from non-human primate, but we know of users who have used Brainstorm in rats and mice, and hopefully a growing number of, uh, of models. By the way, if this is of interest to many of you, we can think of having a demo uh, specifically for those tools um, in, uh, in, uh, over the next few days. So don't hesitate to vote or ask uh, in the chat box for uh, this kind of uh, specific uh, demo, okay? Any other questions, Mark? I think I need to unmute, unmute you manually. Yes, okay, go sorry. Ahead. And there's noise around, so I will keep muting myself. Um, okay. So no, I think we can go, uh, go ahead and start with Martin. I'll, I'll do my best to keep track of all the, the specific questions uh, after we've, we've seen the overview. Super, thank you. So Martin, whenever you're ready, um, maybe I need to unmute you again here. Okay, I think you're good to go. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Good, let me share my screen.
and again just for mark if there is any question mark that you see and that is uh, you know specific of a certain step that martin is showing maybe it's better to interrupt the flow and ask the question okay mark sounds good so can you see my screen properly yes okay great so um this i will i see that i we already have a lot of or many questions so i'll try to be quick the purpose of this was to give a short demo first of all for more newer users to give them an overview of some of the many things that you can do with the software as well as highlighting some newer features that could be of interest to more experienced users uh, along the way um, so that we could maybe spark some questions about this so uh, very quickly first of all here i have uh, the main brainstorm window open here and uh, so for new users typically you'll want to have this um, window open typically on one side of the screen or if you have many screens on one of them at all times because this is this is where um, your brainstorm database will start being populated so as you first of all import uh, raw uh, your raw data here as well as as you uh, continuously um, produce some intermediate or derivatives files this uh, data set will start to be populated such that uh, each of these little uh, objects here, I'm in the anatomy view here, so we see MRI and surfaces. Um, if you right click on them, uh, you'll see uh, many operations that you can do. First of all, ways you can visualize uh, this data through figures. Um, so uh, Brainstorm is based on MATLAB. So every time you sort of open up uh, data sets, it opens uh, a new MATLAB figure. And these MATLAB figures can be, um, can be controlled from Brainstorm. Maybe I shouldn't have opened this figure. I wasn't really thinking because it, it has a lot of vertices, so it will take a while, but that's okay. Um, while this is loading up, I can um, sort, of, sort of give you so, uh, some explanation about what we're seeing here. So, well, here it is. So this is a Cortex file and that we have uh, extracted from FreeSurfer. So, um, so far for people that want to use their own anatomy, uh, this is useful when we project to the source space. Um, we have, you have um, the option to import an anatomy folder that uh, has surfaces extracted using the free surfer softwares or other similar softwares. Uh, for your information, for newer users, uh, if you just straight up um, uh, import the MRI into the software, and while I'm talking about the MRI, let me just open up the MRI viewer here. So um, this is obviously um, the MRI viewer where we can scroll through um, slices uh, of your um, MRI files, as well as select a specific voxels, and you can see uh, these voxels uh, with many different coordinate systems. Um, but as I, as I was saying, um, for those of you that are, have been using FreeSurfer, for your information, one of the new features is that if you right click on the MRI, we now have this CAT12 MRI segmentation option here. Whereas you can do um, similar to what you've probably been uh, doing through FreeSurfer, um, so this uh, segmentation uh, of surfaces, um, but straight from the software and straight from MATLAB. So this allows you to, uh, well, not have to install, obviously, an external software. And it's actually pretty fast. Um, I think Francois is in the chat, he can uh, confirm, but I think it takes about an hour for a subject, which is pretty reasonable for a MATLAB-based uh, process. So here I'm showing a case where we do have uh, anatomy imported for uh, this specific subject. Um, for many people, such as uh, EEG um, working people, um, you do not have your um, you do not have a participant specific anatomy available, and that's okay. So we do have a default anatomy available in, in the software, and actually many default anatomy. If I just right click on this here, you can go to use template and see many anatomies uh, that uh, or template files that we have available, including you know even infant files, or you can create your own um, if if you know your specific research question um, requires a specific template that you have in mind. Uh, another new feature, so I'm still on the anatomy view here. Um, so another new uh, feature that we have available, a new type of surface or anatomy file are fiber files. So if you right click on a subject, you can now import fiber files. Um, and this will be in the TRK uh, TrackVis format. And um, so here I have one um, imported already to save some time. And for your information, so uh, I know that probably most of you do not have diffusion MRI available 
uh, with your subjects, but uh, we do, um, uh, and I have written a tutorial about this on our website, we do uh, ship a fibrous file that was extracted and aligned to the ICBM template, which is a pretty well, um, or our most popular template used in the software. So if I just double click on this, this fiber file, uh, you will see, um, obviously fiber files can have like hundreds of thousands of, of different uh, fibers or streamlines for those of you that are um, used to these. Here I have extracted only 3000 fibers just to get a good overall overview of the different um, fibers covering the brain. Obviously not all of them are here. And uh, if I go here on the surface um, tab here, I can control this 3D figure to add other, um, other surfaces. So let me just add the cortex to just show you that this is indeed, let me add some transparency here, that these fibers are indeed uh, aligned to this, um, to this template. And so if you want to, and I will show this later, if you want to analyze your connectivity results or visualize them in another way, um, if you have fibers file, or if you just project them to this ICBN template, you can then use our free to use for, I mean, freely available fibers uh, template file on our website uh, to enhance your connectivity uh, display. Okay. So if I switch to the, fu or the functional data view here of our data tree, uh, this will contain pretty much all of our, you know, recordings, as well as any derivative coming from our time series recordings, including sources, time frequency analysis, connectivity results, and so on and so forth. And so obviously the first hierarchical level that we have here are subjects. In our case, this is a nodball auditory experiment. Um, it's just the data set used in the tutorial website, on our website. Um, here we have a single subject, but obviously in many experiments, you'll have multiple uh, participants uh, here. So you, you're free to just create multiple um, new subjects. Um, and this is a way to organize your files. The next way um, would be to create different folders, or we also sometimes call conditions, um, because often your participants would go through you know, many steps of the, uh, of the uh, paradigm or the experiment, so many different conditions, and you can group, group your files in this way. And you're free to sort of organize all these files uh, yourself. And for your information, everything that is listed, or for the most part, everything that is listed here, all these files are actually physical or real files on your hard drive. So when you're, you first set up Brainstorm, it asks you to create a, what we call a Brainstorm database folder. So inside this database folder, you can look and see that you will first have your different uh, protocols as, as folders. And inside these protocols, you will see the same hierarchy. So subjects and conditions, and then these different MATLAB files um, that are Brainstorm objects. And so this allows you, um, while I'm talking about this, let me demo this to you. This allows you to um, play with these objects from MATLAB. So those of you that are running uh, Brainstorm using a licensed MATLAB, you can just, ri just right click on pretty much any object, Brainstorm object here. And well, first of all, when, whenever you right click on, a, on an object, you can see all the different ways you can display this uh, object or also some specific or typical operations that you can do. And similar, and uh, also if you go to the file uh, menu here, you can ex export this file to, um, to MATLAB. And so it's a it actually asks you to create a specific variable name. So this is an average. So my average, for example, and if I go to the MATLAB window here, you will see that we do have a newly created uh, variable here in our workspace called my average. And if I double click on it, we can see all, this is essentially the brainstorm structure of this file, so many metadata fields that maybe are not relevant to you but are uh, of use uh, that are used by sorry, by Brainstorm. But this is documented on our website. But if you're familiar a bit with the structure, you'll know that the this F matrix here is actually the data file. And so now I have this matrix that I can play around with using MATLAB. I can run my own scripts. I can um, you know run this on another software maybe that runs through MATLAB other scripts. And then you can even modify back this, uh, this matrix as long as it keeps the same dimensions, right? So here the, it's 340, which is our number of channels, our number of sensors, by 361, which is our number of time samples. And so I'm free to modify this file and go back to the software and visualize it. So if I go back to brainstorm here, let me close my tab. I can go back to the same menu, go to file, and then this time import from MATLAB and it detects that, oh, this uh, my average variable 
has a structure that, that makes them recognize it. I mean, if I click OK, then when I double click on this file, the data would be updated. So you can um, make take advantage of the brainstorm display features as, as long as you, you know, Google and have a look at our website to make sure you use the, the right structure, but it's very well documented. You can take advantage of the display uh, visualizations in brainstorm, even if not all of your data was processed in the software. So I'm get, getting a, a bit ahead of myself. Let me go back and show you when you, you first start your analysis, you'll obviously want to import your data files. And Sylvain has already hinted at all of the different, um, all the different formats uh, available uh, in the software. And you know, we're very active um, on the forum whenever you know, a proprietary format um, is missing. And uh, if we can get in touch with the, the company to get a bit of a documentation, we, we, are, we can very quickly implement it. So if I go to this little drop down here, I can see all the different data types available. Make sure you select the right one before you open your file. And so, you know, for MEG, we have the very typical CTF, Electra files, more general or um, files, uh, electrophysiological um, data formats coming from other software, such as Field Trip, EEG Lab. Um, you know, very basic ASCII or CSV uh, files, uh, you know, as well as EDF and so on and so forth. And so once you have uh, imported or um, linked your RAW file into the software, um, it, it creates this little link to RAW file that's telling you that uh, the data hasn't been copied yet, but it's just a link. This, this uh, lets you only import the data once it is processed to avoid, you know, duplicating data files because we know that RAW files can be huge in size. Um, and so let me just double click on this raw file and I can show you our um, raw display viewer. Uh, let me switch to the uh, column view. So here, um, as I mentioned, we have 340 uh, sensors. So we see them all uh, overlaid on top of each other here. This can be maybe a bit overwhelming. Uh, so you can actually choose to display only a subset of sensors at once. And we call these montages. Um, this is a CTF, uh, this is a, a MEC file that was acquired here at the MNI with our CTF system. It does come with um, built-in montages, so built-in group of sensors that are meaningful together. Uh, but know that you can also uh, create your own custom montages. So if I go to edit montages here, and I create a new channel selection, I am free to select you know, all the sensors of interest that I want. And I can also add a custom keyboard shortcut. So because I called it my montage, let me type M here as the keyboard shortcut. And now whenever you have this uh, recording um, opened up um, with our time series viewer, if you, you can see here the, the different um, keyboard shortcuts that were assigned. So we know that Shift A opens up all channels and Shift M opens up my new custom montage that I just created. So for, if I click Shift A now, it will automatically open up uh, this, well, this is not a montage, but rather all of the, um, all of the sensors at once. And if I click Shift M, and very quickly um, go through different montages like this in this fashion. Um, maybe let me select you know, a subset of montages that are our sensors so you can see a bit what's happening under the hood. Um, we have at the bottom here a little timeline that lets us move forward um, in time through our recording. We see here that the recording was 360 seconds with 60 or 600 hertz, sorry. And you can choose uh, the duration of what we call page. So the raw viewer uh, was coded in such a way that you can uh, scroll through this viewer, so scroll through your data for uh, inspection as if it were a book. So we have different shortcuts here. And as I press, for example, F3, I'm moving forward in blocks of 10 seconds at a time because this is what I selected as the duration of my pages. And going through the recording to you know, do some quick data inspection. And we very clearly see here that there is probably an artifact. This is actually a blink, and we see that it's marked here. And this, um, this is a nice segue into the next thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, which is that uh, all figures in Brainstorm that come from the same data sets are linked in time and if, if there's frequency involved, also in frequency together. So right now I'm displaying the, you know, the MEG raw time series, but I, I, I can also open up, for example, the EOG here. And it's going to open up a second figure linked to my original figure. And as I move forward, so my little 
red uh, line here, let, red cursor, is the uh, time. And I'm pressing the keyboard here and going moving forward in time. Now the page duration is very small, so maybe you don't really see it moving with the with the quality of the stream as well. But all of these are linked together in time, so such that. For example, here we see that this clear artifact was really a blink because we can see in the vertical EOG here that there was a clear blink. And so this can very be very easily detected automatically through the software. So if we go to the artifact menu here, we see that we have different ways of automatically detect um, events for you know, very common artifacts. So heartbeats, eye blinks, you can also detect other custom events or uh, other artifacts. As well as once they are detected, you can also correct for them. So for those of you, you know, familiar with EEG literature, we do have the ICA and component uh, correction, very often used. Um, also for, for Megan in our lab in particular, we like to use SSP, which is sort of a similar process. Um, it's based on PCA to extract uh, principal components based around your event of interest. So if we wanted to correct for the blink artifact, we will, uh, you know, select this option and it will actually um, uh, extract the time window around our event of interest and extract the different components so that if we remove this the contribution of this component and I can give you a demo right here so this this was uh, this was the, the top 20 components extracted from the iBlink event and if I plot them as a topography the first five components for example you'll see that the very first component which had the highest contribution at 20 percent is very, we can visually see that it's very related to the eye. So this, the contribution of this component is probably related to um, the, the eye blink artifact that we want to remove. And if I close this, I think you can appreciate that you can um, select to remove this component on the fly. And if you look at the blink here, as soon as I select to remove this first component, you'll see that it's pretty much 100% um, corrected. So you can play with these components on the fly. I did the same thing for cardiac uh, in order to clean your data. Uh, another uh, new feature that uh, I want to highlight is um, the new types of events as well as new types uh, or new ways to, to visualize these events. So we see here that uh, at the top, we see these different events that were coming both detected from my artifact detection process. So that's the blink event, as well as coming from the acquisition system. So in this paradigm, the participant what was presented with different standard tones as well as deviant tones, and they were asked to press the, uh, the button when uh, a deviant tone was presented. And so we see these events coming from the, the raw file um, here at the top, as well uh, as you can um, now display them in other ways. So now they're displayed as a dot, but if you go to display options, so I just right click on the figure here and go to display options, sorry, and events. You can also, well, first of all, hide them, so select none, or also display them as lines. And now you'll see like a whole line going through the whole re re reporting, or sorry, the whole uh, sensors, our whole figure here. Vertical lines, hopefully you can see uh, them through uh, the streaming of, the, of my screen, where um, you can very clearly see if the timing of the event is really important for you, you can very clearly see um, when this event has occurred. So that's one way. Another way also to visualize this is we have created a new type of event specific for channels. So let me just create a new, uh, new custom event here, just call it my event. So this is not new, you could always create uh, events on the fly. So if I just right click and select add event, or just use the E keyboard shortcut, you see that now I'm add, adding custom, um, custom events here manually. Let me just clear them and show you that if you select a specific channel, you can also add an event-specific channel. So now I selected this MLF13 channel, right-click on it, and you see that we have an option also to add a channel event rather than a general event, with the keyboard shortcut being to control E. So when I select this, um, you'll see that the event is only related to this channel rather than uh, all channels. So this can be a uh, this can be useful for, for specific types of analysis. It's a new feature. Let me just delete this and maybe close the raw viewer unless um, Sylvain has other things in mind to show for the raw viewer. 
if not thank, uh, thank you uh, martin maybe to give you a little bit of breathing room and for yeah. the sake of the flow of the maybe of the presentation before you move to something else let's experiment uh, something i see that uh, mark is raising his hand so i'm gonna uh, unmute him if you have questions um, that you would like to ask directly to martin and i'm uh, i'm talking to everyone in the in the group please raise your hand and i'm gonna unmute a couple of you folks so that you can ask your question but first uh, mark thank you um so maybe a first question that was related to what you were just talking about now uh, what do you do if you don't have EOG channels and you want to clean Blink? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, maybe let me open up the topography here. Um, so this is a, a common case. If I put the topography very big and I show the sensors, well, maybe this is too much. Um, what a lot of people do typically, um, and you know, so if you have uh, other ideas, please let me know, but they often select one of the electrodes that is closest to the eye they sort of consider it as your sort of eye tracker. And when you take the highest contribution of this um, specific electrode very close to the eye during your eye blinks, then you will consider it as, uh, you know, as an active blink. That makes sense. Does anyone has a question, have a question on the specific uh, topic we are covering now? Please raise your hand. There was another one uh, okay. I think that's, that's relevant to uh, pre-processing. Um, so when you mark bad segments, um, one question was, does every process automatically reject those segments? And I believe the answer is no. Am I correct? I would say yes, actually. Yes? Okay. I, I, would, say, I would say yes as well, indeed. Okay. Like, um, <laughs> Maybe uh, if Francois wants to jump in as well, but uh, uh, please raise your hand, Francois, if you have access to a microphone. Um, and I can unmute you. But, uh, I think some very specific processes do have a checkbox options telling yeah. include back segments, but otherwise you can expect them to be all excluded, I would say. Okay. And, and the, the follow-up question was, uh, can you epoch and automatically reject uh, those those bad segments. Or I think it was, um, can you just, in a, in a way, get rid of those bad segments? But I think the, the, the question was specifically when you're epoching. Right, so when you're epoching, I, I was coming later to that, but that's okay. Um, if uh, a portion of your epoch contains a back segment, you, we see an example here of a segment that has a little um, red exclamation mark here. It, it will actually reject the whole segment. And if you wanted to sort of include it, then you can right click on it and actually accept it. As for a way to actually sort of still using this, oops, sorry, still using this uh, epoch, but then removing only the part that is bad, I'm not sure of the best way to do this. I don't know if Francois has any ideas. To me, this doesn't sound like the best practice, to be honest. So there is a question from Solofo uh, regarding, you know, how you approach basically artifact rejection and detection across many subjects. Because as they as they point out, you know, not everyone, not every participant will have data affected with artifacts the same way, and that's very true. So you know, labs differ in their approach to the question. Um, in our lab, for instance, we try to have a very um, specific approach on a subject-by-subject -subject basis. So like Martin was showing, we essentially focus on things that we know exist, like especially in MEG maybe, heartbeats, but also in EEG artifacts from uh, eye blinks and, and, um, and saccades and also muscular artifacts. So we try to have this tailored approach of uh, detecting those events first possibly automatically with the, the approach that uh, Martin uh, illustrated very briefly, and then uh, design basically principal component analysis around each event and projections away from, from the major components. So it's not quantitative per se, it's re reproducible for sure. If you, um, you know, there is no uh, stochastic approach to that. It's really, really, you know, uh, basic second order statistics that are reproducible every time you launch the method 
Um, but if you want to be quantitative about the effect of removing the artifact or not, one possibility that you could do is, um, that you could pursue is actually, for instance, if you look at event-related averages to an event, let's say a visual event, you could still epoch your data without removing artifacts first, use the raw data and epoch the data, average it and look at, let's say, the amplitude and latency of the first component of interest in your data, event-related component of interest. Um, and then you do the same after, you know, rejecting uh, and correcting for all the artifacts that you can identify and look at the average after, after this uh, procedure and compare quantitatively the attenuation in signal strength. So, um, you know, it's hard to have a very general um, standard way of doing things. Um, it's, it's, again, a matter of tradition in every lab. But uh, it's, uh, I think it's a good practice recommendation to maybe try to do what I'm suggesting here. Some of the labs are more, you know, um, looking at using ICA systematically. Uh, in our lab, it's more, uh, you know, artifact specific, but I'm not saying it's better. It's more a matter of tradition. And I think in science, tradition also is, uh, is important, at least for teaching purposes, so that at least things get uh, <clears throat> done in a consistent way across lab members. Um, any other? Oh, I see a few hands. Maybe we can start with Christina. I'm going to try to unmute you, Christina. OK, thank you. Um, I, have, I have one question that, as you mentioned, we should choose the, the electrode that is closest to the eye to detect eye blinks. Uh, I'm working with uh, EEG, uh, mostly ERP. And I have a question that uh, there are three electrodes that are very cl uh, close to the eyes, the FP1 and FP2 and FPZ. So it's better to uh, detect eye blinks with FPZ, or I can put the three electrodes together in the event name box. So which is which, yeah. which better? That's a good idea, Christina. Um... Um, so you, you could indeed combine all these three electrodes in a montage, like Martin was explaining briefly earlier. You could actually um, look at them uh, all three together, or you could even mm -hmm. compute an average or a difference between uh, um, different electrodes around the eye. I have to be honest, I'm not very knowledgeable about these things because the common practice in our lab is to add specific electrocylogram electrodes. So one, um, you know, for detecting vertical eye movements. So usually we put one above the eye, one below the eye, and mm -hmm. one um, right there on the, you know, on the side of the eye. Um, yes. And then we use those electrodes directly as references, and it's much less ambiguous. But if you don't have these electrocylogram um, mm -hmm. electrodes, then yes, I would recommend you you do a montage. You combine those, these frontal and prefrontal electrodes, in a montage maybe use a difference between FPZ and, and the other electrodes you were mentioning, if that emphasizes the blink, for instance. Yes, I understand, thank you. And another question, if I have the vertical EOG and a horizontal EOG, I should um, detect, for example, one by one, vertical first and then, then horizontal, or I put the two uh, together in the event name box. Uh, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I don't know whether I explained myself clearly. No, no, it's I clear. Usually uh -huh. the blinks are more visible in a, in a vertical EOG from our mm -hmm. experience. And I think um, most of our in most of our studies, we, we essentially focus on detecting the blinks and removing them using the vertical EOG. The horizontal mm -hmm. EOG can be you know, helpful to detect saccades, mm -hmm. but you know, um, saccades are very hard to um, detect, perhaps not, but um, to reduce in terms of artifact amplitude. And some subjects produce larger saccade artifacts than others. Mm -hmm. So it's a headache. So if oh. possible, if compatible with your research question, you want to design a protocol and a setup, an experimental setup, where there is limited possibility for the subjects to saccade. So if they can saccade, it would be between presentations and between uh, intertrial, um, I mean, within intertrial uh, intervals. but the best way to get rid of saccades is actually for the subject not to produce saccades. Of yes. course, it's a challenge <laughs> if you study saccades. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, so Christina. You think, yeah, so you yeah. think the best, 
so, so you think the best way is to use the vertical EOG to remove eye blinks? In right. our, yeah, in our experience, I think it's the vertical EOG, which is definitely the most um, okay. informative to remove eye blinks. If you can okay. add an extra channel, I would, I would encourage you to put uh, the VOG channel. Okay, thank you. We'll, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for <laughs> coming today. So we have Brian Kaufman. I'm going to unmute you, Brian. Good morning, Dr. Okay. Uh, yeah, hello. So my question is related to SSP and uh, EEG reference projection items. Uh, is, is it currently possible or is, it, uh, is there plans to, in, to include the functionality to include these in epoch data or segmented data? Yeah, it's, it's, am I unmuted? I'm not sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I sorry. Uh, uh, yes, it's possible to apply your um, SSPs on uh, even averaged uh, data. I don't know if um, <clears throat> Martin can show that very, very quickly if you open an average indeed here. Um, and if you, um, oops, I need to make room on my screen. I think it's when you right click over the, the display of the time series. Let's say there is an artifact there. And um, so if you right click there, I try to remember how to do it. Francois, would you know? Um, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly how it's possible, but it's possible there. So I'm going to try to unmute Francois. Can you hear us, Francois? Yes. Sorry, I didn't follow what, what you said about. Yeah, the question, Francois, was whether you can define an SSP uh, projector, let's say, in uh, epoch data, let's say, in this average file here from snapshots. a topography. Oh, it's in snapshots. So, Martin, if you go to snapshots, and um, uh, I don't see it here. Yes, it is somewhere. Uh, no, you do it from the, sorry, you do it from the topography. Ah, okay. Display so the topography to... first because it's the, yeah, actually the topography, the component that you're trying to. That you makes sense. Right click there and then snapshot. And then snapshot. Okay, save, save as a projector. projector. Uh, you Thank you, Francois. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's that's very helpful. Uh, can can we? What about for EEG reference? Uh, can can we apply an EEG reference? I mean, I know you can do it with a montage, uh, but but can you apply it as a projector uh, in Epic or average data? I don't think you can apply it as a projector. You mean you would like to re-reference your data on the fly by just applying right. a projector? For example, say uh, you used a mastoid reference and your, your data has been completely uh, averaged and it, it turns out that, that you want to apply an average reference to measure some, uh, some waveform. Uh, is there a way to measure the, the wave as if it had an average reference, um, given that it's, it seems that you can't apply the, the EEG reference onto the epic data? So here we cannot show in the demo, I'm sorry, because it's MEG data, if ah, I'm not yes, mistaken. But you see there is, there is a way for you to actually um, re-reference your data on the fly, either through this menu here, that's a process per se, or it's via the SSP menu. I think it's there, artifacts. If you go there to artifacts, yeah. There is the re-reference EG that is grayed out today but it's possible to, so to speak, play with that and actually re-reference your data on the fly. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Mark is raising his hand, so go ahead, Mark. Yes, sorry. So um, I, I was uh, not paying too much attention. I think you just, uh, you just answered partly the question, which, uh, which was also how to apply SSP and ICA to uh, EPOC data. But I think that's what you just said. Am I correct? <laughs> yeah. Uh, ICA, oh, okay. I'm not entirely sure you can do it on EPOC data because of the, um, it depends on the length 
of the of the data. You know, ICA is very greedy statistically. It's looking at you know higher order statistics in the data. So mm -hmm. if your epoch data is very short, for instance, to the extreme, it's an event related average over only 500 milliseconds. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'm not even sure a brainstorm would let you run an ICA on such a short. Right, um, but but are you able to apply the projectors that have been calculated before, for example? Oh, um, yes. Um, if you go back to Martin, if you cancel that and you go to artifacts, uh, I think you can go to load projectors or select active projectors. Mm -hmm. And so you you're, see on, there you're on the raw file right now. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay, but in principle, you see in the menu, the there same. is a little folder that you can open and you can load uh, SSP or ICA projectors that you may have, you know, computed before and apply it to your data. I'm not sure it applies to epoch data. And I don't see exactly why that, that would be interesting because, I mean, uh, of course, we, can think of, we cannot think of all possible scenarios. But um, if there is a compelling case why we should uh, be uh, allowing this kind of thing, um, please maybe drop us an, uh, a message or a post in the forum and we can brainstorm, no pun intended, together on it and add this feature if it's not available. Okay, I don't see uh, other hands, uh, you know, in the in the box here. So Mark, is there any other uh, burning questions maybe? Or Martin, would you like to, you wanted to show something else? Sure, I can move on with um, some very okay. quick scripting and search uh, features. Thank you. Okay, so let me close this. So the very quick operations that I just have just shown you so far um, have been, you know, working on bring some objects just through the, the mouse with right clicking on it and double click on it. But uh, know that um, in order to see all the different, you know, ways you can process or analyze your data and brainstorm, we use what we call in the bottom and I've just quickly featured uh, this uh, answering some questions, which we call the process box here. You can, you can think of this as a data bucket where you drag and drop one or more objects to process. And so these will be the inputs to um, the process that you want to, to compute. And if I click run here, it opens up a pipeline editor that lets you select one or more processes to apply. And so this lets you see all of the different uh, processes available to you in Brainstorm. Those grayed out are just not compatible with the type of file that you've uh, added as input. But um, you know, obviously we won't have time to feature them today, but for your, for your for information, the pre-process, we have all the different filters uh, available to you in all the different operations that I've just uh, quickly demoed to you uh, from the raw file. In standardized, you have different ways to normalize or uh, concat concatenate or uniformize uh, your data. Uh, in average, you can average your files. In sources, uh, you can obviously compute your forward and uh, inverse model, so your head model, your source model, uh, as well as uh, other you know, operations such as the covariance and so on and so forth. Um, one thing that I wanted to feature with this is that let me just select a random process here. So let me add a notch filter, for example, here. So when I select the process that I want to apply here, if I click run, obviously it will go ahead and compute this process. Um, but if I don't click run yet, I can add more, um, more processes one after the other. So let's say after my notch filter, I also bandpass my data here. And so you see now that both processes are one after the other here, and you can always go back and change the parameters of your process uh, before you run. And so this allows you to, first of all, create a more complicated pipeline where, you know, maybe you want to click run and let it run for, you know, minutes, hours, you're not really uh, looking at your data anymore. So that's one way to, you know, um, run new things in advance and run them later, as well as, well, either you run them now, or you can also save this pipeline to run it later and then load it later, as well as generate a script. And let me just do this now. Um, I had already created a script here, but now I have uh, this pipeline um, uh, all scripted. So you can run this later just from the, the MATLAB. This requires that you have a license MATLAB installed. 
But we see here at the top, we had the list of files that we had as input in our process box here. This is just my raw file here, as well as our two different processes and with all of the other parameters that I chose uh, that are listed here. So this lets you, first of all, you can uh, enhance this automatically generated script so that you can add a loop here and say, for example, uh, for my specific subject number three, for example, I want to have a different, you know, parameter for my, um, for my process. That's one way to do this. And also, you can obviously always share this script with someone else that they can run it, it on their own data, or also even uh, push this script to a remote server. And you can now run a brainstorm. If you type brainstorm server when you run the, the program, it will open up the, the, the software without any graphical user interface. So you can run this through the command line on any cluster and then run this script. And this sort of segues into a new feature uh, also that I've added, which is this little search uh, database um, icon here. If I click, click here and click New Search, um, I can now, um, so here in a very small example protocol, we don't have many files, but in a real you know, example, when we have you know, hundreds of subjects with hundreds of processed data, you can quickly get lost uh, into this brainstorm uh, database. And so uh, in order to find the exact file that you want, you can now um, search through all of your brainstorm database using this little icon here. And you can create a somewhat advanced search also using Boolean logic. So very basic uh, example here, let me just search for any um, brainstorm object that contains the, the, the word raw. So that's a very simple search here. And we see that we have two files here and the result is bolded. And we also see their parents here. Um, so that you know where this file is coming from, because often just the name of the file doesn't tell you everything. You have to, you know, um, put your cursor and everything. But one way, uh, or using this, you can copy this this search now. So I'm just right clicking on the tab, search tab. So this created a new tab. You can still have your original database with all of your objects on the database tab, as well as one or many active searches that you can, you know, close anytime you want here. And I can copy paste this search. So either from the search icon here, copy to clipboard, or I right click the uh, search tab here and copy to clipboard. And this actually produces a somewhat advanced uh, search query. So just telling us, you know, every uh, file that, that name of the file contains this file word here, very simple. And this is actually compatible with our filter, uh, our little filter uh, here. So if I go to the database, Share this list and just add my whole subject. We see that we have 200 you know, files process. But if I put my filter as a as a search query here, now we only have our two files that we have found. You know, our two raw files that we have found here using this search query. Similarly, you can use this search query in a in a process. Actually, from the the search here, I can go to my search icon and say generate process file. And we now have this. Um, this, uh, this process that exactly uh, performs this, um, this search query and so that in your script, you'll only process you know, files that contain this raw keyword, for example. Um, so this was a very simple example, but you know, for your information, you can add more uh, sort of advanced Boolean logic. So I can add an end. So make sure that the type of the file is a data file. In this case, it will hide the raw file. Here we go. Um, let me give you an example where I have a search that has um, uh, many files that I want to process at once. So let me just source, uh, search for my source files here. And you see that we found two different sources, source files in two different subjects, one in my group analysis and one in my you know, first subject. And now this allows, we can uh, select quickly all these searches to get all of these objects together either to write on them and do an aggregate operation so I can delete all my source files together, or also I can, let me clear this uh, process box here, I can also drag and drop all of them at once. And in order to do that in an even faster way, let me just edit my script here. You can always edit your search on the fly to hide parent nodes. And now we'll see that the two, um, the two objects are all in the same hierarchical level, so I can just shift click and there only have two objects, but in real case, you will probably have you know, hundreds of objects. You can select all of them at once. So just a, a nice uh, quality of life here. Oh, and um, just to finish, 
whenever you have a group of files selected in the process box, you can always right click in the process box and copy this test file. And so let's say that you had created a script before, but this was specific, you know, someone else's data or some other experiments data. So you'll want to change obviously the, the input file variable here to your new data of interest. Well, you can just drag and drop this data into the process box, copy the list, and then if I just paste the list here, we see my new two files selected here. So that's one way to quickly edit your scripts using the software. That's really cool. Questions about scripting, searching? Yeah, there is a question, Martin. Um, more generally, uh, I think it's Filippo who's asking the question. He's asking whether there's a way to learn or to know which uh, brainstorm function does what. And I guess Filippo is interested in scripting. Um, so, so go if ahead. You're specifically talking about the process, which with pretty much every process, when you select it, we have a little button here called online tutorial. And when you click it, it will open up your browser and it should open up the relevant section of the tutorial file that specifically you know, explains what this process does as well as at all the different options. So that's for specifically for processes. If you have more of a question about scripting, I go to the tutorial section. We do have the our very last advanced, you know, tutorial page on scripting. And now there are like much more, it is much more in depth as to, you know, the specific, let me see here. I know that there's a section about, you know, for example, all the file manipulation functions that we have in brainstorm, you know, all the different functions that you can you can do outside of just processes. So if you want to do a very advanced, you know, script that doesn't only um, make use of processes, but more, you know, um, advanced scripting functions that help in brainstorm, they're all documented here. You know, here we have the display functions and so on. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think that answers the question really well. In general, Filippo and others, if you want to know which um, function does what, like Martin said for the search, you can design your pipeline using the graphic uh, graphical editor for the pipeline. So it could be just one function. It could be as many functions you know you want to apply to your data again as a assembled as a pipeline, and then you uh, generate the script. Uh, equivalent to that graphical pipeline and it will basically show you which functions have been called and how so that you can cut and paste or copy and paste directly into your own code. I have to say also thanks to Martin, Francois and um, all the you know the main contributors to the to the software the code is really I think really nicely documented and explained and commented and it starts with the organization of the of the functions in the subfolders, you know, in uh, in the brainstorm install. So for those of you who are more you know comfortable with uh, scripting and uh, and coding, etc., it should be relatively easy for you from you know learning by example, basically. Also the the, the large scripts that Francois has produced for the group analysis paper, etc., to basically reproduce, copy and paste segments of the code so that you start being uh, really uh, fluent with the library. Um, I don't see any hands in the crowd. Do you have any questions on scripting? Ah, there is Mark. Go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry, it's not a question on scripting, but I thought uh, one of them that I'm also curious about would be uh, relevant. So someone asked for EEG data. Um, when you have the topography, there's some interpolation being done. I know that for NEG, there's the option of showing the topography without magnetic interpolation, but I don't know for EEG if there's the same option. Um, and if so, maybe if you can just show that for, for this person. Because they were ask, asking about the, what, yeah. what the interpolation is and if it can be changed. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Um, maybe you can open a, an average file. Of course, this is MEG, but in principle, it's the same for EEG. And right click uh, over the average deviant file that you just highlighted, uh, Martin. Or, yeah, topography, perfect. Uh, but no, actually, I wanted to ask you please to go back to the data tree. Okay. And over this highlighted file, just right click over it. 
And you see, so there, there, there are collections of uh, basically all the data that is embedded into the file. So it's sometimes here, it's for instance, it's quite specific of MEG. You have also ECG, EOG anyway. So yeah, so there is, a, as you can see, there are three to four different ways of looking at the topography. There is the 2D disk, the 2D layout. The interpolation indeed um, seems to be quite specific to MEG. So, do you know the answer, uh, Martin or Cha Francois? Do you have the, the answer? Whenever you want to jump in, Francois, just raise the hand, or I will unmute you here. So is there a way to show the data without spatial interpolation? Yeah, I'm not too sure about EG. Maybe. Yeah, I, I just posted uh, the message on the, on the chat. Uh, you have the same um, menu for EEG, so it would display the unsmoothed, the, the raw EEG without any smoothing, with a submenu like this, no interpolation. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the description of the uh, of the smoothing that is done is in this link that I just posted in the chat. Oh, so if you're interested, you, you can just look it up. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I don't know if you guys can save the chat for later. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions regarding whether the chat uh, box will be saved and distributed. Uh, maybe it's because I'm the host, but there is a, on the bottom right, you can save the chat. Maybe it's not for you, but I will do that for everyone. And um, Martin will share through the email list that we have through your registration, okay? Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Mark again. Is there any question, burning question, that you see in the in the chat box? No, apparently not. Oh, oh sorry. Yes, right, go ahead. So. Um... Nothing burning. Uh, there are some more advanced questions. I don't know uh, about time if we what what else you wanted to show before uh, we get to these. There's questions about uh, combining EEG and MEG, uh, connectivity, uh, scouts, things like that. So um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, what I would like to suggest is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have 45 minutes left. I know I had we had scheduled about an hour for the meeting because we didn't know how this would go. But I think it's going pretty well and I see there are still more than 130 people connected. So let's uh, continue the discussion for the next 45 minutes. And then we'll, uh, we'll realize you know, whether we reschedule something next week, maybe more specifically, depending on what we saw in the chat box. But at this point, um, maybe I have two requests for the group. Somebody please you know, raise their hand and ask a specific question. Um, or if someone also wants to share their screen and show basically the, the kind of struggle or question they have on their local installation of Brainstorm, I think that would be a fantastic way to entertain the conversation. So does anyone want to ask a question? Maybe while people think, while people are thinking, uh, I can ask one of the previous questions. So, uh, as yeah. I mentioned, one of them was about combining EEG and MEG, and they were asking uh, if there's a way to uh, to combine that the two for doing the inverse model, um, or if we have uh, the intention of of adding that as a feature if it's not there. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the question. So um, I don't think we have anything uh, implemented in Brainstorm to do it um, uh, at once, this MEG and EEG uh, inverse modeling. Uh, there are some papers out there that propose method, you know, to, to do it. Um, um, but um, essentially what we put in the software is driven by either our own, uh, you know, research motivation, but also very much so by the community. And we haven't seen so far a lot of MEG and EEG, uh, or requests for MEG and EEG combination. Uh, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, but in our own labs uh, and in the research community uh, of Brainstorm so far, 
there has there hasn't been a, a request for that so i see um john mosher uh, raising his hand so maybe he has more specific uh info john please i'm trying to unmute you Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so we do have uh, in the uh, inverse localization algorithms. You can uh, technically check both boxes for EEG and MEG. So you could run your inverse model on that. But we don't really run it for two reasons. Uh, one is that the the units are so different between MEG and EEG that we're not all that confident of how, how the noise covariance and data covariances are properly regularized and stabilized. So it's better to stay within one modality. A subset of this problem is working with uh, magnetometers and gradiometers in the neuromag data. So it's, it's still a more of a numeric problem than it is a theoretic problem. Uh, the other practical problem is that EEG source localization still tends to yield a different location than the MEG, everything else held consistent. So the community is still kind of at odds. How do you combine EEG and MEG properly where you don't force one modality onto the other? So it's there, but we don't really promote it. Exactly. So I have also a very practical advice. If you really want to explore um, a form of fusion of MEG and EEG, and, and probably it's not entirely uh, kosher, so to speak, but you could produce a source model for MEG and a separate source model for EEG. So that would yield two different source maps. And what you could do is just mm, take the average of the two or the sum of the two. And that's possible with Brainstorm. And um, maybe it's better if you do it uh, in Z uh, transformed mode so that you use uh, basically a deviation from, from baseline or deviation from a reference time period. But um, this is so to speak, a poor man's approach to this fusion, it's really not optimal, but at least it's a, it's a synoptic view of all the, the data you have available to you at once. So we're definitely worth a try. But again, the demand for you know, this fusion, although in principle it's very virtuous, um, has been very low. And we don't do much of uh, simultaneous EEG and MEG in my own lab, so I'm not particularly driven by that, although I should, I guess. So. There is another question from um, from the audience. So, Mark. Yes. So it's another uh, question from a while back, but I think it's interesting. Uh, so we have made some uh, some recent work. We, we have done some recent work on connectivity methods. Um, so someone was asking specifically if we intend to add uh, WPLI, so weighted PLI instead of PLI, uh, phase lag index. I believe the, the or phase locking index, yeah. I don't know. They all yeah. have uh, similar yeah. names. So uh, yeah, so what, uh, maybe someone can just uh, resume uh, what, what we've been working on uh, recently and, and what methods uh, we intend mm. to add, perhaps. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, it's a never ending uh, answer. The bucket list uh, for connectivity measures in, uh, in EEG, MEG, and in general, electrophysiology is uh, bottomless, <laughs> uh, is endless for the, I think for one good reason, it's because we know too little, if anything at all, about the mechanisms of information transfer in, uh, in the brain at the scale of what is accessible in, uh, uh, in electrophysiology, uh, be it, uh, you know, source EEG, source MEG, etc. So that's why, uh, you know, you see this inflation of, um, and long, 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 pro I mean, many, many propositions of um, different measures for connectivity. So the philosophy in, in brainstorm is a little bit like the inverse solution, which um, you know there is, as everybody knows in this group, I'm sure there is no unique solution to estimating sources from scalp measurements. Our philosophy in the group has been to basically boil down and offer up to the people out there the methods we use in our own labs um, because we know them better, I think, and their limitations uh, as well. Um, or tools that are really, really in high demand elsewhere. So that includes S. Loretta. I saw a quick, um, I mean, a question about S. Loretta uh, in the group, uh, but also, um, you know, other things related to connectivity. So my short answer is why not? I mean, if you, if you can post in the forum and make a competing case, I'm not asking for a dissertation or like a, 
a full paper that you would write as a request. But if you can make a, place a request to the forum, then we would be very happy to look into the possibility to including um, WPLI in Brainstorm. Maybe cite a couple of papers you found really compelling again uh, for the case and uh, how it stands out from the other you know, you know, methods that are already in the toolbox. Um, and then we would gladly look into it, especially if you help us with the coding of the WPLI or if there is some MATLAB code uh, available out there, um, then we would be very happy to consider it, really. Um, but more generally, uh, there's been a lot of work done in Richard's uh, Leahy's group um, to basically revamp and revisit uh, the, 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 the toolkit we have for connectivity. And that includes even basic stuff like coherence or amplitude envelope correlation, grand jury causality, et cetera. So it's been entirely recorded by um, uh, folks in, the, um, in Richard's group. And I think now it's much better also documented because uh, the documentation was really lacking uh, over the years. And um, now we're in a better position. It could be better, but um, we are getting there. And by the way, if you folks want to contribute to documentation, the website that we use is basically a wiki. So we, it's very easy for you to contribute docs um, and additions, even you know, typo, uh, uh, you know, corrections. So um, if anyone wants to contribute, please uh, shoot me an email or uh, use the chat box, and we'll uh, we'll contact you because more help is always very welcome. Um, there was a question before. I see that Mark is raising his hand, uh, John. Do you have anything to, to, to say here? Because I see your hand is still uh, up. But, yeah. I, I think, I don't know how, how do you put your hand back down? Do you just click it again? <laughs> oh, you just did. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, it was raised from before, so. Okay, okay. Sorry. okay. No, no problem. There is a, a question from Eleo Nonora. I don't know if it's your, your, your if I pronounce it correctly. And also emphasized by uh, Tyler Andrea. So they are asking if it's possible to mark a channel as bad only for a portion of the data. So maybe Martin can share his screen again, but basically the philosophy folks is that if a channel is really behaving ethically and it's good and then it's bad and then it's good and bad, what you have as a tool in Brainstorm is to highlight the portions that are obviously bad and declare them as bad. And like Martin was explaining, the uh, brainstorm will consider these uh, segments as bad and will not be included or will be flag, flagged in the subsequent you know, epoching processes and will not be considered uh, for further processing. So that's an example Martin is showing, thank you. So you see, you just highlight the segment. And, um, but maybe the question is whether we can declare just the channel uh, as uh, as bad, I think. I think Francois, you worked on this uh, recently, right? To have a, a channel specific event um, marker. So maybe, if you don't mind, I will unmute you again, so that you can help us with this. Because now I understand how specific the question is. Okay, you may unmute yourself, Francois, if you want. Yeah, uh, you can, if you select a channel and then select um, a time block. Okay, like Martin is showing now, yeah. Yeah, if you mark this as bad or, well, no, if you add, so add delete channel, channel event, period. This would mark mm -hmm. only okay. your channel. If you, that was selected. It can be one channel or multiple channels. So ah, this is nice. not really developed to mark channels as bad. This is developed to tag, uh, for instance, yeah. epileptogenic events when you're reviewing uh, epilepsy data. It's yeah. it it's the the use case for marking as bad one channel is not really very interesting. I would say. I think yeah. I did it though. I think that if uh, there is an overlap when you import your, when you epoch your continuous recordings, if 
uh, your epoch overlaps with a bad segment, it would mark the bad segment, the, the segment as bad in the database. If it's overlapping with a channel level bad segment, it would mark the channel only as bad and the trial as good. Oh, nice. Okay. So it, it's all supported. Yeah, super. Thank you. I hope it answers your question, folks. Even though, as a, I think it depends on what you want to do. Like if you want to uh, stay at the scalp level, then maybe it's useful indeed. But at the end of the day, you want to look at your data across the entire raw recording, probably. Maybe computing an event-related average. And if you're, there is a channel that toggles back, I mean, uh, back and forth between good and bad, then there is a lack of consistency across the entire recording, um, for even for just one participant. And that, make, that can make your life more difficult when you want to do like an event-related average uh, across many trials with different channels being good and bad. So the common denominator would be, of course, the channels that are declared good across all trials. So indeed, like Francois said, I'm not entirely sure the use case um, can survive, so to speak, across all the possibilities offered by brainstorm up to source mapping. But at least you can, you can mark those things uh, probably the way you want to. Uh, Tatiana, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm new to the community and uh, I would like to ask a little bit more general question. Uh, I'm coming from the area of clinical epileptology and I would like to understand what is the scope of application of brainstorm outside of my area. Maybe what you do is like the brainstorm is not designed uh, per se for that. What are the other, other areas that you are working with and like what's the scope of application of brainstorm? Yeah, sure. So, like I said, that the maybe after the first question, it's essentially a research tool um, that we make available to everyone for everyone interested in uh, in uh, you know electrophysiology at large uh, in humans and animals. So that's a very very large potentially uh, research community, right? From people looking at basic mechanisms in animal models of Parkinson uh, or even behavior, um, you know. Head motion, uh, head motion, for instance, or uh, navigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in humans, I mean, the realm of applications is very broad, from clinical aspects that you know better, but also basic uh, neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, um, even resting state activity, how it relates to uh, structural connectivity in the brain and uh, and task performance. So. We have to bear in mind that still today, I think even though fMRI is very strong and it's a fantastic uh, you know, modality, first of all, it's not accessible to everyone. And also it's limited in many respects, right? Um, and that's, that's for another discussion, probably. And still today in the literature, EEG is the, is the most used uh, technology. Uh, MEG is a little bit of a, uh, of a niche, I agree, but EEG is really, really used everywhere because cost is relatively affordable and it's very versatile. You can use it to study patients, um, infants, uh, children, um, uh, folks with uh, dementia, um, et cetera, and healthy controls, of course. So the, the application, uh, the field of application is very broad, I think. So you would, could you say that uh, clinical epidemiology would be like 10% less of, uh, uh, everything else? That's a good question because on our website we share a list of the the papers that our good users have been uh, uh, publishing using the tool. Um, so we haven't looked at how they use it per field and subfield of neuroscience and neuropsychology. So it's hard for me to put a number uh, on how many are doing clinical studies versus uh, you know um, more basic neuroscience. But it's a good idea. We, maybe we should look it up and uh, look at keywords and realize um, how brainstorm is used per field. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. I'm sure. meeting myself now. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I see uh, a question from Imaging Workstation. It's like a gamer's name. So is it recommended to do source localization with 14 channels? 
So yeah, that's one of the realities uh, faced by many, many labs uh, and people around the world that uh, yes, they do have access to EEG, but often it's, it's, you know, it's uh, typically 10 to 20 channels because that's the standard in many labs still today. So in principle, imaging, I don't know if it's your first name or last name, but yes, you can, but you have to be conscious that of the fact that you're gonna be very limited in terms of spatial resolution, right? Because uh, you have to basically estimate sources across the whole brain and in brainstorm, we use about 15,000 different points across the brain at minimum to uh, uh, estimate brain activity. And if you do that from only 14 channel, channels, you realize you have very little data at every time point. So it's very challenging. And at the end of the day, yes, you will have a model of brain activity and maybe it's going to answer some of your questions. But the spatial resolution will be very smooth, very um, and that's okay maybe, but it's very hard to predict whether it's, it will be not only smooth, but also you know, a bit biased, meaning that it's gonna show you peaks of activity in certain brain regions that actually are, are wrongly localized. So it's, it's very much a challenge, um, but there is a, you can always try. And you, my recommendation is to try, but to, to try um, with the you know, data that um, are, well, um, or experiments that are well established, meaning like uh, median nerve stimulation. You know that around 20 to 30 milliseconds, you have a first response from the primary sensory cortex. So if your source map with 14 channels show you that, then you can be confident to continue and uh, with uh, more sophisticated paradigms. But I would, I would um, recommend, you know, uh, cautiousness and uh, go step by step in terms of validating your pipeline with so few channels. Yeah, both, yeah John uh, has added uh, some comments here. Oh, thank you, go ahead. As both Mark and uh, I both added some comments to that saying that would not recommend it with so few channels. Yeah. Uh, that even in 1020 work with EEG and epilepsy, we tend not to try to do source localization. You can, but it's not very, not very accurate. 64 channels would be a good, uh, acceptable number to get into source localization with EEG. Below that, uh, sensor level mappings and more classic differential arrays like the double banana that's used in epilepsy are the more classic ways to examine low channel count. Thank you, John. Yes, that's the voice of reason here. Uh, <laughs> Mark, you have another question from the the yes. Um, so there's uh, one that just came up on the on the chat as well. Uh, so how about subcortical sources? Um, so when and how would you uh, recommend using uh, project sources on on subcortical structure? And are there any papers? And I was thinking about uh, Emily's work with uh, uh, yeah brainstem brainstem sources. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you, whoever asked the question. Um, Sergio. Sergio, thank you. I'm just fetching the paper in question, but that's one of many from the community now that's showing evidence of uh, subcortical signals, especially, and the capacity of EG and MEG. Just pasting here. I, I cannot do two, two things at the same time. I realize that. So, um, yeah, so an MEG to detect uh, subcortical sources. So when to do that, I mean, I would recommend, and that's only my personal opinion and maybe experience, to include subcortical structures in your source model. And maybe Martin can show how, how this is possible. Uh, so do it only when your research question is really interested or targets you know these uh, subcortical structures so it could be auditory brainstem pathways it could be subcortical nuclei involved in movement or motor actions i mean you know better um, depending on the literature and um, you know your own hypothesis if you want to really probe what's going on under the cortex then obviously you have to include uh, subcortical structures in your model and there are different ways of doing it with brainstorm the first one without access to the individual MRI would be to use one of the templates we provide and do some volume um, source imaging. 
So not restricted to the cortex, but actually you would have one voxel of activation at every voxel of the MRI, pretty much. Or anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit here. And um, so no anatomy constraint. And therefore you can basically put regions of interest into deeper structures and look at their time series. Um, if you do have access to the MRI or if you don't trust the, um, that the um, uh, anatomical, or if you trust that the anatomical template would do a good job for your subject, you can use the subcortical atlases that we provide with Brainstorm. And that feature basically everything from the brainstem to the putamen to the pallidum, caudate, thalamus. Um, so, and you could, you could definitely give it a try. So I see that Karsten Walters, oh, thank you Karsten for joining today, uh, is raising his hand and I'm guessing this is to comment on that. So I'm gonna unmute you, Karsten. And thank you for being here today. Thank Go ahead. you so much. Uh, hi. Um, we want to localize auditory sources. Um, so the common approach is very often a two-dipole approach. Uh, very often, especially if you have EEG data, you need some priorities. So for example, the volume of the auditory cortex, and you would like to keep the, the dipole fit in such volumes, or also in MEG or in combined EEG MEG. Uh, how, how good are the features of brainstorm for dipole fits? Uh, good old dipole fits, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, John is the most qualified to answer this uh, question because he's worked on it uh, a lot in brainstorm. John? I was just answering another question in the chat, so I missed the beginning of the question. Sorry. So uh, in essence, uh, Karsten is asking whether, um, I mean, what are the dipole fitting tools or features offered in Brainstorm? Is there a way to constrain the dipole fitting to Cortex? These kind of things. And Karsten, please uh, pitch in, I mean, jump in if, uh, if you want to refine my interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. What I, was, what I was just answering in the uh, chat box was that uh, an easy spot to look at is in the uh, advanced tutorials on source estimation for the Neuromag Phantom or the Electa Phantom, you'll find a script where we individually fit uh, 32 dipoles and then we merge them all together into one group of dipoles. And as a subset of that, we can fit either volume grids or source grids. The dipole scanning doesn't really distinguish between the two, it's a grid's a grid. So when you build your head model, if you, if you build a uh, surface grid, then that's what you'll do the scanning on. If you build a volume grid, you'll do it Conversely, on that, I'm not sure if this is this is what you're asking, though, right? Whether you can do so possibly more text. concrete. If, if, for example, if we take only one sensor, uh, uh, one part of the sensor cap in the MEG, the left part or the right hemispheric part, and then we we fit single sources, uh -huh. and then in, in the area where they are fitted, we constrain them so that if we then do a two dipole fit to the whole cap that they keep somewhere in the volumes of the auditory cortex. For example, something like this. Is, is, is Brainstorm very flexible to do that? I, I do that regularly with Curry, but I do not know how, how Brainstorm could do that. It's definitely flexible to select just the right sensors and do the fit. And if you select the right side sensors, your dipole should fit to the right side. You won't have the data from the left, but in like some magnetometer arrays, the left dipole will still be in the right sensor array, so you might still actually have a two dipole problem. In gradiometer arrays, this is less of an issue because the gradiometers really, left gradiometers see only sources to the left and vice versa. EEG, which is what I think you're also asking about, and uh, magnetometers, it's harder to just restrict yourself to one side of the array and then uh, hope that the data from the other side isn't in the in the array. In the auditory example you're giving, that usually works out fine though. The auditory sources are so far on either side that they really are localized in just these regions. And if you fit just the right side data, you should get a single dipole on the right side and vice versa to force them both together, then you're back to a two dipole problem. So I think you'd still treat it as two one dipole problems, left side and right side. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much, and we will try it. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, Mark, do you have a question? Yeah, there are uh, some more questions. Maybe I'll go with um, 
there was one about epilepsy and there's one about uh yes the e the double scanning one got uh, was answered i think so uh let's go with the epilepsy one um sorry i'm i'm losing a little bit uh no problem where was it about okay, epilepsy. I'll, I'll, yeah i'll find it again let's go with the other one i noted earlier so uh this one is a bit more uh, involved about source connectivity and scouts um, so it was a bit more specific. Maybe we will, we can use uh, Martin's uh, demo for that. Uh, but uh, he was saying that there was no pipeline option to select scouts when doing uh, connectivity or something like that. So um, I'm not very familiar with that part of brainstorm. Maybe someone can uh, yeah. show a little bit more about that. You know, it's a great question, and um, but I think I think we do uh, we do feature what you are asking for. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever asked for it. So I don't know if Martin uh, can still show and share his screen so that we give it a little try. Oh, I need to unmute you, Martin, sorry. Yep, go ahead. I think probably the issue, well, let me share your, my screen. Uh, you just need to make sure that uh, you're processing sources rather than recordings. So if I just drag and drop this uh, so you can see my screen yeah okay so if i just drag and drop this recording that also has source um, uh, computed so if i select here process recordings when i go to uh, connectivity it will not let me so let me cho choose correlation or whatever it doesn't let me choose uh, scouts because this is an, uh, a recording time recording file so this is on the sensor space so you just need to make sure, first of all, to have a obviously head model and a source model computed for this file, and then make sure to switch to um, process sources here, and so that when I click run and go back to any you know end by end connectivity measure, let's go correlation again, then you have your scouts uh, available. So here uh, you can choose either you know an existing atlas or your user specific scouts, and if you don't have any listed, it's probably that they. They haven't yeah. been saved in your user scouts here. I, I haven't created any here. That's a very good point, yes. Thank you, Martin. I hope it answers the question, but um, that's what I, I had in mind when I heard the question indeed. Make sure you define your own scouts as regions of interest, and maybe we could uh, talk about that a little bit if you want. Um, or use an atlas, uh, like the parcellations that uh, are provided by FreeSurfer and other partner tools. Uh, that are uh, basically available to you whenever you import one of the anatomy templates or if you process your MRIs, individual MRIs through those tools. Um, any other question, Mark? You're welcome, Sergio. Yes, I think there was one more. Um, right, so. I think the question was, uh, should we do source normalization, for example, Z-score or uh, DC offset, those types of operations before or after uh, extracting scouts? Yeah, that's, uh, that's always a, an interesting question indeed. And um, again, our personal experience in the lab and our best recommendations, um, again, in our group is to um, basically produce your source map um, at the individual level uh, if you have a group of subjects of course and then if you want to compare subjects at the source level if you want to extract scouts time series etc you want to compare uh, basically measures that are standardized between subjects um, because for many uh, reasons be it uh, physiological or um, different uh, snrs etc conditions you know, different participants may uh, yield and produce different uh, current strengths um, estimated from EEG and MEG uh, scalp recordings. So you want to standardize between groups, uh, between subjects. So when you extract source time series in scouts, or if you, even if you want to compute a group average of your scouts, of your participants, make sure that you uh, Z transform the source maps um, with respect to a baseline if, you, uh, if your paradigm is the typical event-related you know, uh, response um, type. 
and before you compute an average or um, you know look at uh, at uh, group effects um, definitely i mean this is a, a very simplified version of a very long answer um, there are you know um, these are these are things that are explained in depth in uh, the tutorials um, especially the statistics uh, portion of the tutorials because there are many caveats when manipulating z scores because they tend not to be distributed as uh, gaussian variables so a lot of the t-tests you know that are um, that we um, readily do um, may not apply when you manipulate z scores so please have a look at the detailed tutorials in brainstorm and we can have maybe a session on that at another occasion so that um, you have all the information. I gave you just the, the flavor and the philosophy of standardizing uh, to compare individuals, basically. Oh, Sergio, I did not realize it was you in, uh, in Santiago, Chile. Yes, I hope it's gonna work, yes. Yeah, the uh, Sergio issued a very kind invitation for us to go back to Chile and, and deliver like a two day workshop. Of course, there is only so much you can do remotely. Um, it's always better to meet in person and I'm very confident we'll be able to do that again soon. But I like the idea to have these kind of meetups, uh, remote meetups maybe on a more regular basis, even when we go back to normal. So there is a question from uh, Heidi uh, asking for uh, stats and sources. Um, I mean, it's a very broad question, right? So uh, maybe Martin, if you don't mind, you could share your screen again, please. And just show a very, even, you know, in principle, how this would work with the process to tab, for instance, if we want to compare to, let's say two conditions on, um, here we only have one subject, but that works also for subjects. I mean, across subjects, sorry. Oh, I need to unmute you again. Sorry about that. You're good. Okay. So, right. So, so far we've been using the process one tab, but we also have a process two tab where we can essentially compare, you know, um, group of files together. And so, let's say, for example, here that we have many, you know, source files coming from this deviant condition as well as many source files com coming from the standard um, conditions. So if I group them together in these two different groups, then I have access to um, some other types of processes. So if I could run here, um, and so I have you know, uh, processes to compute um, certain types of differences, as well as you know, just certain types of t-tests, so parametric permutation tests, and so on and so forth. And we do have um, connectivity-specific um, a process is available, although I'm personally not that familiar with them. And maybe yeah. I note that uh, on our tutorial page, we have a specific tutorial page for statistics that do details yeah. um, an example with connectivity. So I exactly. Can... Yeah, that's right. I, and um, that's what what I was referring to before. We have uh, extensive, uh, you know, tutorials. I mean, they could still be completed. I mean, I know some parts are missing, and you know, um, we are doing our best. Uh, we have other, also uh, other full-time jobs. So again, it's a call for a contribution from the community <clears throat> to contribute documentation, especially when you see gaps <clears throat> in our tutorials. But thank you, Martin. I, that's exactly what I meant by showing, you know, how you would compare basically two different conditions. <clears throat> there was also another question from... Uh, Yes, Kiran and others, the, uh, the recording at least of the chat, I mean, the, the text exchanges will be made available maybe as an attachment to the email that Martin will send to everyone. The video will see how it comes out uh, and where we can store it, maybe on the YouTube uh, stuff. But uh, in principle, yes, we could, we could do that. Um, oh, microstates, yes. So thank you, Francois, for replying. Um, so we've been working with a group in, uh, in Chicago, at University of Chicago. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the PI, so sorry for that. But indeed, they had developed this approach to microstates called uh, SENA, SENA. And uh, Francois just pasted in, uh, in the chat box the link 
to these tutorials. So we try, and I mean, when I say we, it's more Francois who's keeping an eye on this. Uh, we try to maintain the integrity of the tools whenever we have plugins, but it's the, the, the primary responsibility of the, of the folks who contribute to you know, make sure that it's still working, etc. And I know there had been some technical issues um, with the, the Sena uh, microstate develop, uh, decomposition not working entirely well with, uh, with new versions of Brainstorm. But uh, there, there was little we could do because uh, we, we were expecting modifications from, uh, from the group. And Francois is saying indeed that uh, the microstates are not working at the moment. So please contact the Sena people so that indeed they put a little extra mile into you know, making it happen again for you. I had a quick comment on statistics. Sure. So there was a, a share, can I share my screen for a moment? Yeah. There was a question earlier about uh, for dipole modeling. Do you see my screen now? It's yeah. coming, yeah. So uh, in, when you're doing dipole modeling, and the, and the best example to even go through is to look at the script for the fitting of dipoles to the phantom in the tutorial. But once you have the dipole fits, if you click on any one dipole in the display, you get up then the statistics of that fit in terms of goodness of fit, the uh, chi-square, the degrees of freedom, what the reduced chi-square is, the amplitude orientation of the dipole. So these are all values that are a bit more familiar, particularly to uh, people fitting with XFIT and Neuromag. We don't have the confidence volume per se. If you import the results from Neuromag, then you'll also get the confidence volume uh, brought into the results. So there's there are some statistics available uh, in the dipole scanning itself as well. Good point. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, Martin, there is a question uh, from... Um, oops, sorry, I just lost it. Uh, from Eleanora. Eleonora, sorry, um, concerning drawing a scout on the cortex. So if we want to draw a region of interest or a scout in Brainstorm, there is a way to draw it on the cortex directly. And I will unmute you in a second. But there is also the possibility to uh, draw it directly slice by slice in the MRI volume. Oops. Right, so not sure what exactly the question is, but to draw it on the cortex, you can just open up any you know surface file, go to the scout tab, and uh, click the little crosshair here, and this will um, you can click essentially on the on the actual surface to uh, create um, you know your scout your region of interest where uh, the voxel or the the vertice that you clicked will be the seed. And then you can grow it uh, however you want, and you can also merge, um, you know, regions together and so on. Uh, what is the question exactly? Sorry. So yeah, thank you. Um, Eleanora is asking, or maybe you could, I could unmute you, Eleanora, if that's okay. If you raise your hand, I can do that. Um, but I understand she's also saying you can draw a scout directly in the MRI volume, slice by slice. So maybe you okay, could do it's that. Okay, MRI. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, yeah, you have to open, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, edit MRI. So from the Scout tab, go to Scout, edit an MRI. Obviously, I need to select the Scout here. It's going to interpolate my surface and MRI together. Eleanora, I will, is that okay? I, I saw you were raising your hand. Are we answering your question? I will unmute you now. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi everyone. Um, so actually, my question was not for the cortex for that, but uh, when you have to draw a scout within the volume, the brain volume. Oh. And that's okay. more complicated because these. That, that's what I'm saying. That when the cortex, it's uh, easier because you can draw it slice by slice. But when it's in the volume, that's not possible. If I'm not wrong, and whether you're, mm -hmm. that's something that can be done. Yeah, so I think I understand your question indeed, and that's a good one. So you can still draw, um, well, in principle, let's see if that's the reality now. You can draw, like Martin is showing now, your scout in the slices, and it could be outside of the cortex. It could be, let's say, even in the white matter CSF. But 
uh, and in principle, if you use a source model that is defined as a grid in the MRI volume, then these uh, scouts should uh, stay. Meaning, I, what I'm trying to say is that you could extract time series even from the white matter, you know, because uh, because the, the the sources. I mean, there are some source models there. The, where I'm not sure about my answer is whether if you do that. Um, you would be able to still extract this source time series and whether brainstorm would actually be pretend, <laughs> pretentiously smart and try to project your scout onto the cortex regardless of what you're trying to do. So, Martin, do you have the answer or maybe Francois? Uh, I posted a link in the, in the chat box. But volume scouts, you can have a look at this. this uh, I guess this is what you were referring to when you're using a, yeah. a volume source model? Yeah, exactly, Francois. So it's possible, the short answer is yes. Well, so then after that, I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah. So the idea is to have a volume scout indeed, if you use a volume source model and extract the time series from the scout. Yeah, so this is documented yeah. in this thing that they just posted. Thank you so much. So I think you're good with that, Ele Eleonora. Does that answer your question? Um, my question was more impractical. I would to, maybe yes, I don't know. I, I have to try, like yeah. to draw it because I have done that, but to draw it was very complicated in the volume. Yes, the draw is complicated in the volume. Diet. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, so maybe uh, what looking you can size use size as possible. If you want to use an atlas, you can load your atlas, uh, like the EdSeg atlas from FreeSurfer. You can load this as a volume atlas. So this is also documented uh, in the same page that I pointed out. And if you want to use uh, an existing ROI that you have somewhere, you can load it this way. Okay. Uh, it's a bit further, it's in volume atlases. Uh, the section just after the scouts in the same page. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eleonora. Thank you, Francois. So I suggest we take one last question and um, um, we're gonna have to go, And uh, but let's meet again soon. And it's a question from Andrea. Uh, she's asking, or is asking, sorry, um, what's the most reliable way to downsample a cortical surface? So we do have uh, a, an, an easy tool, I think, to do that in Brainstorm. Maybe Martin can again share his screen. I think you're unmuted, Martin. Yeah. Sure, so we'll typically recommend to do this from the full resolution cortex file. So if you just go to the anatomy and right click on the cortex file, you can select less vertices here, and then you can type the number of vertices that, that you want. And then before you compute your, um, your you know, head and source models, make sure that the lower resolution cortex of interest to you is, uh, is selected in green. So you can double click on the cortex to select it. And this will be the one used for the source model. Exactly. I read Thank the question you. as I think, which is, I think that I read the question is, uh, which of the methods is most reliable is the way I read it. We have three methods. I think the question was what more reliable method. Oh, three methods to then sample. No, doesn't that pop up when we actually go to resample Martin? I don't think so. I don't have the option. I don't think we have different options to resample the cortical sur or any surface. Uh, Constantinos is saying that it uh, pops up after you select the number of yes. vertices, would you like to try? Yeah, see it. A little window pops up here, see? Once you select the number of vertices you want, then it asks which do you want to use, the reduce patch or these other techniques. 
which we put a lot of work into uh, this, okay. uh, many years ago. Uh, I just, I would just try all three if you're having a problem reducing it down too far and see what comes up. But it was surprisingly complex problem. We read a lot of dissertations and even MATLAB was trying a variety of techniques. So uh, I would uh, try these out. Yeah. I guess it depends on the quality of your original surface segmentation as well, right? Um, and some of the methods uh, provide um, like an homogeneous sampling of the surface. Some others are more dense when the curvature and where the curvature is uh, is higher. So it's hard it's hard again to to give a generic answer, but. Again, from our own experience in the lab, we use the default method, the reduce batch, and it has been serving us well. But I think we, we are lucky to have access to high quality T1 MRIs for our subjects, and that really helps. Um, so it's uh, five past the hour. Uh, there are still 100 participants out there. So, but I think we're going to bring this session to a close. And what I would like to say is probably two things. Uh, I want to say really thank you to everyone uh, who, for showing up today and participating very actively. I hope it has answered your, your questions, or at least some of the, your questions. Um, again, we'll look carefully into the chat and we'll talk to the team and speak together with the folks and, uh, and see whether we can come up with a, a specific um, topic for next time. Um, and I want, the second thing I wanted to say is uh, thank you. Uh, I will see you next time. And again, Martin will share through the mailing list uh, the, um, the, the chat box, uh, maybe a link to the video if it's useful. And we'll uh, keep in touch this way. Uh, we'll send you another email whenever we think we can uh, schedule um, um, a next session. And please uh, keep in touch with us on social media because it's fun and it's, uh, it brings a sense of community as well. Um, and I want to thank really, uh, you know, the team around me uh, today. So uh, John, Martin, Marc, uh, Francois, and uh, the others in the shadows. And in general, it's been a really fun ride to develop Brainstorm for us and for everyone out there. And it's great to see the impact and uh, to hear the feedback from the user community. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll be in touch again soon for another session. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.